What goes on in a killer's mind when there are moments from execution? Do they regret their actions or do they try one last time to put the blame on someone else? Today, we want to tell you about the final moments of eight infamous death row inmates. You're going to hear what Eileen Wuornos had to say about Independence Day. Find out whether or not America's first serial killer, H.H. Holmes, was really in his coffin. And hear about an inmate who set up a website and asked the public for jokes he could tell in the death chamber. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. Amy and I are bringing you all the crime in half the time every week. If you've got less than an hour, let's get into it. Starting with the inmate that inspired one of the most well-known marketing slogans in history. Before Nike used Just Do It to sell athletic gear, double murderer Gary Gilmore said, let's do it to the five-man firing squad standing by at the ready to execute him in Utah. Ten years later, Dan Wyden, head of Nike's Wyden and Kennedy ad agency, used Gary's last words as inspiration for a commercial in 1988. According to Business Insider, Dan liked the do it part of the phrase, or at least that's what he told Doug Prey for his 2009 documentary, Art and Copy. So that's strange. In the same documentary, Nike's former marketing chief agreed. She said, quote, Nike tries not to share the origins of the phrase widely. I'll bet. And in addition to being the inspiration for an iconic brand, Gary Gilmore was also the inspiration for Norman Mailer's Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Executioner Song. In 1977, he was also the first person to be executed in the United States in 10 years. So what did he do to earn his dubious place in history? At the age of 35, after spending half his life in jail for petty crimes, he was offered a conditional release in May of 1976. Just two months after he got out in July, he robbed a gas station attended at gunpoint in Orem, Utah. The man's name was Max Jensen. He handed over the money, but Gary still shot him twice in cold blood. The next day, he robbed Ben Bushnell, a hotel manager. And just like the previous victim, Ben handed over the cash as instructed, but Gary shot and killed him anyway. He also accidentally shot his own hand in the process, which is what got him caught after a mechanic noticed the blood while he was working on his truck. By October of that same year, a jury convicted him for first-degree murder and sentenced him to death. He didn't fight it. In fact, he fought to be executed faster, but controversy around his sentence resulted in three delays. While he was waiting, he tried to kill himself in prison twice. Then, in January 1977, just one hour after a judge granted him the execution he wanted, he was marched in front of a volunteer firing squad of five men with a hood over his head and a target on his t-shirt. The last thing he said was, let's do it. According to the Biography Channel, he donated his organs and two people got his corneas within hours after he died. Next up is Eileen Wuornos, the infamous Florida serial killer that inspired Charlize Theron's Oscar-winning performance in the movie Monster. Now, if Eileen's life could be summed up with one sentence, it would have to be, hurt people, hurt people. She spent her entire life desperate for affection, but she was abandoned and hurt by everyone who should have loved her. In return, she became a deadly force. Some key moments in her terrible childhood include being abandoned by her teenage parents and raised by her grandparents, who then sexually abused her along with their friends. She was also in a sexual relationship with her older brother, and by the age of 11, she was trading her body to kids at school in exchange for cash or food. By 14, she was pregnant by one of her grandfather's friends and sent to have the little boy at a home for unwed mothers. He was given up for adoption she was sent home. But only weeks later, she was kicked out and she lived in the woods. As an adult, she drifted around the United States, getting money through sex work and petty thievery before she settled in Florida. She was married for about nine weeks to a rich man in his early 70s, but they split up after he complained she would hit him with his cane if he didn't give her money. Then things got worse. In the span of less than a year, the bodies of seven men were found along the highway in Florida. They were Richard Mallory, Dick Humphreys, Troy Burris, 
David Spears, Walter Gino Antonio, Peter Seams, and Charles Cruscadden. They had all been shot and robbed, with many of their possessions ending up in Florida pawn shops. And when she was caught, she accused the police of allowing her to keep on killing because a female serial killer would get them book and movie deals. Now, interestingly, three cops were disciplined for shopping the movie rights while they were still investigating her case. Only a couple of weeks after she was arrested, her lawyer sold the rights to her story. And then bizarrely, in 1991, right before she went on trial, she was legally adopted by a couple not much older than she was who claimed that God told them they needed that they should offer her love and support. Well, okay, that lasted until Eileen realized they were actually charging thousands of dollars for interviews about her and planning on selling her artwork and letters, money she never saw. In 1992, she went to trial for the murder of Richard Mallory, and she pleaded no contest to killing the other men. She claimed that she acted in self-defense, but her erratic behavior and obvious anger issues in court didn't win her any points with the jury. They gave her the death penalty. Now, what they didn't know was that Richard had served 10 years in a prison mental institution for attempted rape. And get this, It was NBC's Dateline who dug up his Maryland court records after she'd been sentenced, according to the Orlando Sentinel. So, was Eileen telling the truth? Or did one case of self-defense, Richard Mallory, lead to six other murders? Her case got even more confusing and controversial when she fired her attorney and petitioned the court to drop her automatic appeals and execute her quickly. After 10 years on death row, she said she was done with humanity, filled with hate, and would kill again if given the chance. On the morning of October 9th, 2002, just before she was given the lethal injection, her last words were, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock. I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June 6th, like the movie. Big mothership and all, I'll be back. She was cremated and her childhood friend took her ashes back to her home state of Michigan. Interestingly, she was a big fan of Natalie Merchant's album, Tiger Lily, and she wanted and got the song Carnival played at her funeral. So we've told you about an inmate who inspired the Nike slogan and the bizarre last words of Eileen Warnos. Now, I want to tell you about a guy who actually invited the public to write in with a joke he could tell as his last words. In 1991 in Amarillo, Texas, Patrick Brian Knight was plotting to attack his neighbors, Walter and Marianne Werner. One night, when they walked into their house after work, he and his friend were waiting. The couple was blindfolded, gagged, and kidnapped in their own minivan. Patrick drove them to an isolated spot less than five miles away and made them kneel in front of him so he could put a bullet in their heads. Why would he do such a thing? Because... They'd been complaining about his loud music and even louder visitors. By June 2007, his appeals had run out and he was headed for the chamber. So, he asked a friend of his to set up a website asking people to write in with a joke he could tell as his goodbye to this world. They called it deadmanlaughing.com. By June 26th, his date with death, he had more than 1,300 jokes to choose from. When he was strapped to the gurney, this is what he went with. I said I was going to tell a joke. Death has set me free. That's the biggest joke, and I deserve this. And the other joke is that I am not Patrick Brian Knight, and y'all can stop this execution now. Go ahead. I'm finished. The joke bombed, and prison officials had to scramble to check his fingerprints and confirm he was indeed Patrick Bryan Knight. In 1955, a mob-like hit on an elderly widow in Burbank, California, shocked the city. There had been rumors floating around that she had up to $100,000 in money and jewels hidden somewhere in her house. And those rumors reached the ears of four convicts. Now, Barbara Graham was a sex worker and a drug addict with a need for some quick cash. She was friends with these four convicted felons who needed a pretty girl they could use as bait to rob 64-year-old Mabel Monahan. Now, Barbara's job was to ring the doorbell after dark and convince Mabel she needed to use her phone. When the woman opened her door, the men stormed the house demanding the goods. And when she refused, they pistol whipped her and left her to die on the floor while they ransacked her house. Now, there was 15 grand hidden in a closet, but they missed it. 
and left with nothing but a murder on their record. One of the men claimed he had an attack of conscience and called the police after the group split up. Hmm. If he did, he got the address wrong. Mabel's body wasn't found for two days. Now, when it was Barbara's turn in the San Quentin gas chamber on June 3, 1955, she held her breath for a full minute. Reports say the executioner told her to take a deep breath and it would be less painful. Her response? How would you know? Her last words were, good people are always so sure they're right. Herbert Mudgett, or as you might know him, H.H. Holmes, was one of America's first serial killers. He was responsible for building a hotel in order to more easily murder people. And with all the tourists flocking to Chicago for the World's Fair, he had plenty of victims. The building became known as the Murder Castle. Reports at the time claimed it had 51 doorways opening onto brick walls, 100 rooms without windows, stairs that led nowhere, hidden gas chambers and passageways, two furnaces, and body-sized chutes exiting into a basement crematorium. Depending on the source, the number of his victims numbered from 9 to as many as 200, but like the details of the building itself, the real number of his victims is unknown. He opened his doors in 1892, hoping to attract single young women new to the city. A year later, he fled Chicago and set off on a cross-country frenzy of fraud and murder that left his business partner, Ben Pitazel, dead. On May 7, 1896, he found himself on the business end of a noose in Philadelphia, sentenced to die for his business partner's murder. His last words were directed to his executioner, Take your time, don't bungle it. But his story didn't end there. Rumors were rampant that the man had actually faked his own death and escaped to South America. Speculation was intensified by his bizarre last request. He wanted to be encased in concrete and buried 10 feet underground so grave robbers couldn't steal his body. And that's what they did. His coffin was covered with seven barrels of cement. But was he actually in it? An 1898 report from the Chicago Daily Inter-Ocean reported by Rolling Stone reads, Within two hours of the hanging, an undertaker's wagon containing a casket drove out to the prison yard. That casket was supposed to contain the body of Holmes. Instead, it contained Holmes living. In 2017, his great-grandchildren had his body exhumed to find out once and for all if the rumors were true. With the help of the History Channel, they found out right away that at least some of the rumors about their infamous relative were very real. It took five days to unearth his burial site. Like he asked, he was ten feet down, but six feet underground was an empty false coffin, just in case some determined grave robber tried to take his chances. Another four feet revealed another coffin, the real one, encased in concrete. When they cracked it open... There he was, wearing boots, a waistcoat, and a suit jacket, but no pants. According to the Philly Voice, the reason for this partial nakedness is a mystery, but archaeologists think it's because he soiled himself when he was executed. On his chest was a metal cross engraved with the name H. H. Holmes, and ultimately DNA testing confirmed that yes, the original serial killer did get the ultimate justice in 1898. Have you ever had an acne breakout come at the worst possible time? Last weekend, my skin was such a mess, I was practically running away from the cameras at my friend's birthday party. We all struggle with our skin at one time or another, right? And that's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe, the sponsor of this episode. Apostrophe is a prescription oral and topical medications that are clinically proven to help clear acne and help you hit your other skincare goals. Just fill out Apostrophe's online quiz, snap a few pictures, and get connected with a board-certified dermatologist who will customize a treatment plan to help you meet your goals. Personally, I love skipping the visit to the dermatologist and a trip to the pharmacy. We have a special deal for our audience. Save $15 off your first visit with a board-certified dermatologist at apostrophe.com slash TCR when you use our code TCR. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash TCR and click begin visit. Then use our code TCR at sign up and you'll get $15 off your dermatology visit. That's A-P-O- 
S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash T-C-R and use that code T-C-R to get your dermatology visit and save $15. And we thank Apostrophe for sponsoring this podcast. Now back to the show. John Wayne Gacy was a bigger-than-life serial killer responsible for murdering more than 30 men. He lured them to his house with promises of work with his construction company or offers of sex and drugs. Dozens of his victims were buried under his house in the Chicago suburbs, and when he ran out of room, he began haphazardly throwing bodies off nearby bridges and possibly burying them in the yard outside his mother's apartment in another neighborhood in Chicago. The bodies of these possible victims have never been unearthed, and as if all that wasn't terrifying enough, the killer's side hustle as Pogo the Clown will give you nightmares. In 1994, his last words before the state of Illinois took him out of this world were just as arrogant as the life he lived. All he had to say on the way to the chamber was, kiss my ass. This next inmate really embraced the concept of gallows humor. In 1928, George Appel shot and killed police lieutenant Charles Kemmer in a botched robbery at a restaurant in Queens. Some reports say his last words were, All the ladies love baked apples. Damn, no power outage. While other reports say he met his maker proclaiming his innocence, two years later, in 1930, one of the most vicious serial killers in history went to his death, making sure everyone knew exactly how he felt about his crimes. After a series of robberies and murder at home in the United States, Carl Pandrum traveled to Africa and Portugal to continue his reign of terror, raping and murdering young men. When he got back in the U.S., he kept on taking lives. One quote from him said, In my lifetime, I have murdered 21 human beings. I have committed thousands of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, arsons. For all these things, I am not in the least bit sorry. When he found himself behind bars in Leavenworth for another robbery, he told the warden he'd kill the first person to bother him. And he did. He beat the laundry foreman to death with an iron bar and earned himself a date with the hangman's noose. His last words were, hurry it up, you Hoosier bastard. I could kill a dozen men while you're screwing around. How does acne know the worst possible time to show up on your face? I'm always the one hiding in the back of pictures at parties and weddings because of my constant breakouts. At least it's not just me. We all struggle with our skin, right? And that's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe, the sponsor of this episode. Apostrophe is a prescription skincare company you can rely on to treat acne and help you hit your other skincare goals like reducing redness, wrinkles, and even sunspots. Just fill out Apostrophe's online quiz so they can connect you with a board-certified dermatologist who will create a personalized treatment plan tailored to your unique skin issues. I love how fast it is to submit a visit, and you don't even need to schedule an appointment. I still can't get over how fast it was to get matched to a dermatologist. I mean, where I live, dermatologists are booked out for months. We have a special deal for our audience. Save $15 off your first visit with a board-certified dermatologist at apostrophe.com slash TCR when you use our code TCR. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash TCR and click begin visit. Then use our code TCR at sign up and you'll get $15 off your dermatology visit. That's A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash TCR and use that code TCR to get your dermatology visit and save $15. And we thank Apostrophe for sponsoring this podcast. Now back to the show. John Owens, a.k.a. Bill Booth, was an outlaw in the Wild West in 1886. Among other crimes, he was sentenced to hang for the murder of Jacob Schemmer in Wyoming. Jacob had invited John into his house for dinner, and to thank him, John knocked him out with a hatchet and strangled him. He escaped with $5, which would be a little less than $3,000 today. He was caught in Montana and taken back to Wyoming by stagecoach. During the ride, he was said to have confessed with the caveat that he killed the man in self-defense. But it was no use. His goose was cooked. On the way to the gallows, he uttered these last words, I wish you'd hurry up. I want to get to hell in time for dinner. By contrast, this woman's last words were the same as those attributed to Jesus in the Bible. 
Wanda Jean Allen was doing time in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary for shooting her girlfriend in 1981. The circumstances of the shooting were a little muddled for the court's liking. She said it was an accident, but some forensic evidence pointed to an execution-style killing. In the end, she took a plea deal for manslaughter and was sentenced to four years. While she was behind bars, she met girlfriend number two, Gloria Jean Leathers. Wanda was released after serving two of her four years, and Gloria got out not long after she did. So the two of them moved in together, and the next three years of their relationship were rocky. In December 1988, after a horrific public argument, Gloria had enough. With the police escort, she and her mother went to the station to file charges. But when they walked out to the car, Wanda was waiting. In front of the police station and in full view of Gloria's mother, she shot her girlfriend in the stomach. She died a few days later. And at her execution, Wanda stuck her tongue out at the witnesses and then said, Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. And that's your recap of famous last words from Death Row. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. And if you like getting all the crime in half the time, please take a second to give this a thumbs up and hit subscribe and the bell so you never miss a recap. Until next time, take care.